think we uh, are all well aware of uh, the looming crisis of climate change and what it means nationally and globally, and, and certainly we're focused here in Boston. Um, so to introduce the program, uh, I would like to introduce a fellow trustee, Bud Briss, the president of New England Aquarium, and he will introduce the next part of the program. Thank you. So Vivian called me at quarter to five and said to introduce this program. Vivian, I want to know, can I get in the orange bar on the chart for doing this? <laughs> Um, I think the real reason she called me because every map that shows Boston Harbor sinking has the New England Aquarium in the middle <laughs> of the most vulnerable zone. So maybe that's why I'm here. Um, but I actually am very happy to introduce um, Vivian and Paul for four key reasons. And the fourth is the most important one. So uh, number one, this issue is obviously very timely, very important, and particularly because our great city of Boston is quite vulnerable to the impacts of climate change in the future. And certainly Sandy showed us what can happen in New York and it's a good lesson for, you know, for us to take to heart. Uh, secondly, TBHA has a long history and is probably one of the most knowledgeable groups about working on the waterfront and the harbor. So there's nobody who's better suited to tackle this problem uh, and to try to move our city forward in taking good preventive measures. And thirdly, looking at the finance chart, thinking from a more practical perspective, this is a way to broaden our funding base. And this project, and I think continuing work on climate change, will bring in new sources of funding, whether they be from grants, from foundations, or individuals that will ultimately, I think, enrich and strengthen the organization, and particularly our ability to have an impact. And fourth, my most important reason, and this comes from working on climate change for almost 30 years, long before I got to the aquarium, and it's this admonition. Everybody's going to forget about Sandy in about six months, completely, uh, particularly because it didn't happen here. Uh, and there'll be a bit of a backlash on, you know, is it really real, and are we really going to be impacted, and all of that. And I can tell you, having worked in this a long time, the science is really very, very clear at this point. So it's really important for this organization to take this issue on, and most importantly, to stick with it. Uh, we need to not let the memory of Sandy and other storms fade into the you know, far distant past. We need to figure out a way to take preventive action here in Boston. Uh, most importantly, to protect our tax base and to protect the waterfront of our great city that this organization and others has spent so many years um, trying to enhance. Vivi. Thanks, Bud. Uh, following the New England Aquarium and Woods Hole's uh, Changing Climate, Changing Coast Conference in 2009, the Boston Harbor Association approached the Barr Foundation, New England's largest foundation, for support of the Boston Harbor Sea Level Rise Conference in 2010. A diverse planning committee was put together, co-chaired by Deb Haddon of the Massachusetts Port Authority and Jack Wigan of the Urban Harbors Institute at UMass Boston. And both of them have been introduced already. Um, and the committee had state and city representatives, community leaders, and regional representation. So the Boston Harbor Sea Level Rise Conference, which was held in 2010, included some of the most distinguished leaders in our country, including members of the real estate community. And everyone was talking about climate change, mitigation, adaptation. Um, and for those of you who were there, I don't think any of us will ever forget EPA Deputy Administrator Gina McCarthy's rallying cry about, about how TBHA worked to get Boston Harbor clean, and she expected no less from us regarding climate action here in Massachusetts. Or Chelsea City Council President Leo Robinson talking about environmental justice issues and, being, and wanting to be sure that when we address climate action, that we didn't forget communities like Chelsea. So as part of the Boston Harbor Association's ongoing commitment to working with local communities and citizens, we also held a series of community meetings to share our 2010 results. I have to tell you, local residents at Harbor Point in Dorchester and Maverick Landing in East Boston, both developments which have significant numbers of subsidized housing, they get it. The residents in Dorchester, for example, talked about how flooding was already affecting their properties. Uh, Vernon Street, 
and Morrissey Boulevard, and obviously the slide that Julie showed you, uh, where it said we could high tide. That was actually from Dorchester. If there is anything that our efforts have shown, it is that local residents don't need to be convinced that sea level is rising and that something needs to be done. Fortunately, we live here in Massachusetts, in Region 1 of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, where the regional administrator, Kurt Spaulding and his able staff, and we've met some of them here tonight, Doug Gutro and Danny Rodriguez, um, they've been strong supporters of our efforts. Last year, Governor Patrick and his environmental secretary, Rick Sullivan, issued the state's Climate Change Adaptation Report, the first of its kind by any state outlining strategies for adaptation. Now, for those of you who are fortunate enough to live and or work in Boston, you know that the work of our mayor, Tom Menino, and his staff, and Brian Sweat and others from the city are here tonight, have been the model for other cities in the country, working on both climate change mitigation and adaptation. So some of you by now may not exactly know what all these terms are, what the implications are. Don't worry. Our next speaker, Paul Kirshen, is going to walk you through a brief presentation about the work that our consultant team, including Paul, Dr. Ellen Douglas, and Mr. Chris Watson, have been doing as part of the continuing grant we have from the Barr Foundation. Paul is one of the leading experts in the country in climate change impacts and adaptation. Um, his resume, bio, CV, just goes on for pages and pages, his publication, the awards. If you want to see it, you can look on our website. Um, and he's currently affiliated with the University of um, New Hampshire. So following Paul's presentation, we'll open it up to questions and our comments from the floor before we adjourn at 7 p.m. Paul? Good, good, um, good evening. <laughs> um, it's uh, thank you very much, Vivian. I also want to thank uh, TBHJ and the Bar Foundation for um, funding some of the work of Ellen Douglas, Chris Watson, and myself. Um, and I also want to thank you all for coming out uh, this evening and supporting TBHA. I've been working on uh, climate change issues in, in Metro Boston and Massachusetts for about 20 years now. It's really one of the largest threats we face is increased coastal flooding. So I'm going to talk about some of the threats we're going to face from increased coastal play in the future and some of the work we're doing from uh, the Bar Foundation. Um, now, um, you know, I, I grew up in Boston, and so naturally I grew up not liking anything about New York City. And I thought it was great when the you know, Red Sox beat the Yankees in seven games a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, to go on and win the World Series. And I felt terrible when the Giants beat the Patriots twice in the Super Bowl. <laughs> I uh, certainly uh, curse in New York a great deal then. But I really felt bad for New York City when I got hit by, uh, by Sandy. Um, this was a, um, uh, a extremely uh, severe event. The height of the storm surge when it struck New York City was actually much greater than a 100-year event. Uh, someone was telling me today it may actually have been a 500-year event. So it was a very, very rare event. And so it struck at a very high tide, it caused tremendous damage. So everyone's asking, you know, what would happen if, if Sandy had struck, um, had struck Boston? And um, fortunately, in some of the mapping that we had done for TBHA, we had, uh, we had some analysis. This is actually um, uh, a map of, of what, what uh, only occurred in Boston, approximately, when Sandy struck us. Uh, right? When Sandy came, arrived in Boston, it was actually more like a 100-year flood which is uh, still an extreme event, but nowhere near as bad as a 500-year flood. And um, it struck Boston at low tide. And so it really had, you know, we um, uh, uh, had some damage, but it was, it was manageable. And, you know, the colored areas, you can see, you know, a little bit of flight, but nothing really bad. But um, what would have happened if, if Sandy had struck at high tide? This would have been the quote of a 100-year flood. And again, you see in the colors a great deal more damage. There's actually a scale, a scale on the lower on the left there. So like, you know, red is sort of energy is uh, zero to two, uh, yellow is, no, sorry, zero to two is yellow, orange, and then red is like two to four, blue is uh, greater than um, four feet. But you can see, you know, it would have been 100-year floods, and this would have been, uh, caused 
more damage, but it would have sort of been manageable. But of course, we live in this era of, of climate change, and one of the biggest signals of climate change is, is increased sea levels. And we're going to see one to two feet of sea level rise by mid-century, and three to six feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. So um, we have a map here which shows the uh, flight that would have occurred in Boston if we had two and a half feet of sea level rise and Sandy struck at high tide. And um, we're going to have two and a half feet. We're going to have two and a half feet of sea level rise certainly sometime uh, after mid-century. And what you see is you see a lot of flooding. You're sort of going around counterclockwise. You see, you know, flight at Logan Airport, you know, two to four feet. You see flight in East Boston, two to four feet. You see flight in Charlestown, uh, two to four feet. You see flooding at uh, North Station, two to four feet. You see flooding around Faneuil Hall, two to four feet. Look at the Back Bay, two to four feet. Um, and then um, the Boston uh, Public Garden, you know, two to four feet. So there's a lot of water that's going to be in Boston after this storm. And what makes the storm so, 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 so stressful is that the Charles River Dam and also the Mio Earhart Dams of the Mystic are only two feet above the present 100-year flood. So if we have two and a half feet of sub rise, we have a 100-year flood, those dams are going to be overtopped and the water is going to flow upstream into the back bay and it's going to flood, as shown here, it's going to flood, you know, MIT, East Cambridge, uh, you know, Back Bay, those areas in there, as well as Harvard Square and Central Square. It's also going to go up the Mystic and probably flood Bedford Square. So um, it's a case of our infrastructure, you know, designed for a certain event, certain level of safety, but with climate change, it's all being thrown out the window. If live with a new environment and a new reality. I also want to point out if this is the flooding we might see from a 100-year flood sometime after mid-century. But by the end of the century, this is the flooding we're going to see once every 10 years. You know, this 100-year flood is going to become a 10-year flood because of the additional silver rise. So if again, by the end of the century, or even sooner, we're going to see flooding like this once every 10 years. It's certainly going to be unsustainable for the city of Boston and the region. Now, um, the impacts we're going to get from flooding there's certainly the direct cost. You know, there's the damages to, to buildings, damage to infrastructure, both above ground and underground. And then there are all sorts of indirect costs, lost wages, lost tourism, other activities like that. Also, we have, uh, you know, loss of neighborhoods, you know, social impacts. And then we're going to have all sorts of health consequences. Uh, you know, people drowned, unfortunately. There's going to be a lack of access to hospitals and mold after the flood. And there's a release of contaminants into surface waters, untreated sewage. Um, uh, releases from brownfields. So we're going to have uh, major problems. And again, this could be happen like once every 100 years by mid-century, or by the end of the century, it's once every 10 years. So clearly we've got to get a handle um, on these problems. And um, this brings me to, you know, what do we do about this? And there's two things we really have to do. The first thing is we have to control our emission of greenhouse gases, the process of mitigation. And, you know, if, if we manage to uh, significantly control our emissions of greenhouse gases, we might be able to only get three feet of silver rise by the end of the century instead of six. So that would be, uh, that would really uh, decrease the impacts of the flooding. Unfortunately, though, because of the long lifetime of greenhouse gases and also the inertia of the climate system, if we stopped all our emissions of greenhouse gases today, we would have climate change for centuries. So there's no way we can go back to the present climate. You know, today's climate is really yesterday's climate. We're going to deal with uh, climate change in the future. So we have to go through the process of adaptation. How do we adjust our built and natural systems, you know, which are attuned to the present climate, to this changed climate? And this is the process of adaptation. And for the built environment, there are a couple of things we can do. First of all, we can try to protect buildings from flooding. So we could build, for example, you know, flood walls around critical infrastructure, keep the flooding away. The second thing we can do is accommodate the flooding. So we might want to elevate buildings, uh, flood-proof basements, put in place good evacuation plans. So if people do evacuate an area, they come back to an area that's livable. And lastly, we can retreat. You know, we can't afford to protect everything, so we may have to move away from some areas. And 
Um, you know, adaptation is really going to involve a mix of, of public and private actions. They're going to be taken at various times in the future and various locations. And uh, my research and other research and research of my colleagues, you know, we find the benefit cost ratio of adaptation to be like anywhere from two to one to 25 to one. So that means like every dollar we invest in adaptation, in making the city more resilient, you know, prevent, let's say 25 is time, 25 is time as much damage or two times as much damage. So again, investing in adaptation um, in the future is going to uh, pay us back because all the damage are going to be, that, that are going to be prevented. And um, there are um, a couple of uh, attributes of, of good adaptation planning. One is you want to be you know, robust. So you want plans that might work no matter what the climate change is. Also, you want plans that are flexible and they're adjustable over time. You know, we're talking about a new kind of infrastructure now. It used to be when we designed infrastructure, we said, you know, let's design it for 50 to 100 years. Well, now we're thinking maybe we want to design infrastructure that only lasts 25 years. We're also thinking about infrastructure that's adjustable over time. When we build flood walls that we build three feet now, that we jack up to six feet perhaps if we need them. So um, there's a lot of new thinking, creative thinking, going on in the civil engineering profession right now. And also, Many of our adaptation plans, we want to, want to include no regrets. So they make sense to do no matter what. So everyone talks about the value of green space. You know, green space is great because it, it, it cuts down the urban heat island effect, um, which makes cities more livable. Um, also, it, it, it lets us um, retrain, retain more runoff and also creates recreational benefits. So as an example of, um, of um, no regret policy, uh, makes sense now. And also co-benefits. Some of the things we might do to protect one sector also protect another sector. So things like managing um, you know, stormwater drainage might also improve our water quality. So a lot of things we can do for adaptation that provide benefits right now. And lastly, you know, we also want to make sure that um, you know, climate change is not the only stress that we find in, in sustainability planning. You know, we have population growth, we have changing technology, we have all sorts of other things going on. And climate change is one of those drivers to make sure climate change adaptation plans integrated with these other activities. And in, our, in the work we're doing with our TBH, you know, TBA, right now, TBA HIA, HIA right now, the long <laughs> um, <laughs> the work we're doing right now, we're um, actually putting together some um, adaptation plans for some parts of Boston. And we're trying to uh, look for plans that we call here and now, and those we call a here and monitor. An example of a here, and plan, a here and now plan is something you do right now. Like obviously if you build infrastructure, repair infrastructure, you want to make sure it's climate change resilient. So one of the best examples in Boston is the Spalding Rehab being built over Charlestown. And this is going to be, uh, I think it's going to be set by this spring. And essentially when they built this, they built higher than they had to. This is right, this is in the, you know, right in Charlestown, it's very low, it's right near the container port there. And it's uh, going to be higher than it had to be. It's got utilities on the roof. It's got, uh, I suppose it's got food and water there the last seven days. So it's climate change resilient. It didn't cost much more to do this than just normal building. Normal building. So anytime you build something new, you know, make it climate change resilient. And it's very interesting to see what happens in New York City now when they try to rebuild what they do in terms of uh, trying to make the, uh, the city, city, city um, Resilient. Now, the other kind, I'm just going to be heavier, is um, plans is what we call repair and monitor. You know, the big, one of the biggest challenges we face as an adaptation is what do we do about existing infrastructure? You know, we're sure all the flooding we're going to face in a couple of decades. How do we, how do we protect that? That's a set of adaptation options called repair and monitor. And um, the best way to uh, talk about that is an illustration. And this is some work that was done to protect the city of London, the Thames Estuary, from flooding in 2100. Uh, this area gets flooding coming up the uh, North Sea into London. And there's already a hurricane barrier outside of London. But it's not going to be sufficient in the future. So they put together a plan in, in time and in space and how to protect the estuary. So it talks about what they're going to do for the next 25 years. Since they're going to do things like, you know, maintain and exp expand existing flood works. And then in the middle part of the century, we continue doing the same. But somewhere around 2075, we're going to make a major decision on whether to build a large hurricane barrier 
do some other decentralized actions, and to go ahead and build that. But the point about this plan is that people in the region know what's going to be protected. And the other thing is, they're not going to be investing in activities until they have to. They're going to tie their investment strategy into the rate of climate change. So they're going to be monitoring sea levels, they're going to be monitoring storm surges. When they reach a certain point, then they're going to take action. So with this strategy of taking place over time, you know, we, we can, we can uh, prepare for this, preserve our options, and moreover, just spend the money as we need it. And if we're lucky, we'll be able to tie this in with natural renewal of infrastructure. But the point is, to do a strategy like this, you have to put the plan in place now so you preserve the options, you've got a lot of the permitting done, and you're all set to go when the climate changes. So I think this is going to be, hopefully, some of the work that's going to come out of the TBDH study. And you know, we've done a little bit of work already on this, with example, in the area around the New England Aquarium. So we've done a little plan for this, for the, um, this example, for the um, for Mary Hotel. And you can't see this very well, but essentially, we have a timeline there, and some civil rises, and we have some strategies that they can implement over time as, as the climate changes. So I think with that, I, I'm going to end. So thank you very much. Yeah, questions and comments, and then we'll let you mingle and, and finish refreshments. And stuff. Yes. Um, I think you said that, like, for the 100 year flood, most of Boston would be on a, you know, two to six feet of water, correct? That's, that's what two and a half feet of silver rise. Okay. Does, does that assume also a high tide? Yes. Okay. After the tide becomes low, does the water recede? Yes. Okay, so the principal damage is for a short period of time. Well, it's, it's damages. I mean, the, the the water is only there for a period of time. Well, you know, some of our storms, our nor'easters, they 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 last a day or two, and so if it's a hurricane, right, it may only flood for you know a couple of hours, and then we're receding if we're lucky. But still, tremendous damage, like we saw in New York City. If it's a nor'easter, it could last for a couple of days. Yeah, I mentioned, well, I just, yeah, obviously um, there's going to be damage to infrastructure like the tunnels and the transport and the, the T, uh, Logan Airport. Um, we have not looked specifically at uh, the elevations of the tunnels, but we certainly plan to do that. And we've already been in touch with the T, and they're interested in talking more about what's going to happen to the T network. I also want to mention in terms of other infrastructure, we were at a meeting earlier today with a better city, which is very interested in looking at all the infrastructure, not only the transportation, but also water supplies and other things like that. Um, Brian Sweat, who is a member, who is, the, is now the head of the environmental cabinet for the city of Boston, reminded us that when the MWRA built Deer Island, they actually raised our treatment plant more than a foot, not for climate action, but because they didn't want the salt water intrusion into the treatment facility. But the byproduct is we actually have a situation which is very different than New York City, where in New Jersey, where you actually had the wastewater actually going out into the street. We would not have that because ours is elevated. But the whole issue of utilities and other types of infrastructure is definitely something that I think we'll look at. Actually, actually not to correct my teacher here, no, we, we would have. So problems with combined sewers. Yeah, Even though Deer Island would be okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, the truth might be fine, but combined sewers still be a problem. And that still continues to be a problem until they're done with the combined sewer uh, uh, overflow project. On the Charles River Watershed Association, uh, I went to a talk, and basically on the Charles River, they try not to have any development or non permeable building, you know roads, etc., near the Charles River. And it works. It, it basically acts like a sponge and, and absorbs these floods naturally. And at the Cape, the same thing is going on. You'll see areas where they allow tall grasses to grow. And again, that absorbs these floods. And what I see in Boston is there, the solution is, oh, let's build something with something on the top of the building so that we can, once it floods, but the, and I don't think that, I, th I think they need to realize that they need to realize that those areas that you had 
uh, designated as flood areas should probably not be developed. We should probably be figuring out what can we put there as far as natural absorption of these floods because they're going to come. As you said, it's too late now to prevent them. And I just think that here they are developing and developing and putting more and more impermeable roads and so forth in areas that probably we should be using as a buffer. So I, I think if you were to look, for example, at the New York City plan and needs also here in Boston, we are a very dense community. There are homes and places and development in places where you would take these maps to their extreme, there would be no development there. We wouldn't have filled in Boston Harbor. Um, it is highly unlikely that we're going to retreat from development of those areas. And in fact, in our experience going out into the community, like East Boston and Dorchester, people don't want to move. They see what the problems are. You say to them, what if we relocate you? They do not want to be relocated. And I was particularly struck watching the news these last few weeks in New York City, where people's homes were completely devastated. And you had residents say, oh no, we're going to rebuild here. I've always lived here. This is where I'm going to be. So I think that um, from a political and a citizenry point of view, while some might say that we should retreat and not allow development there, I don't think you will have the political will, nor do you frankly have the community support to relocate people to other places. And that's just our observation. Not to say that we're not going to do that, but it is frankly initially what we are seeing from citizenry as well. So I make a point about, about green infrastructure. Um, the, the work that CR, CRWA is doing, that might absorb like an inch of rainfall, but it's not going to absorb, you know, four or five feet of, of, of storm surge. And also, um, we have a hundred year storm with eight inches, you know, green infrastructure is going to mitigate it. It's not going to really solve, it's not going to control that. So we've got to balance, unfortunately, in an urban area, green infrastructure with other engineering approaches. And so it's going to be a balancing act. Vinny, I, I actually have a question for Bud. Oh. Who's, who's working on a, a big project next door to me at the Aquarium. And, and I'm wondering, in, in planning that project, do you consider the climate change issues? And is there anything happening at the Aquarium to help this? Can you come up here, Bud, so they can hear you? Sure. The question is, what is the aquarium doing about being flooded? We obviously know how to deal with salt water, so we kind of have a leg up on, on everybody else. And there's a few things we've done over the last several years, partly for operational reasons, but partly because of this. One is, when the aquarium was built, its entire electrical system all came together in its huge fuse boxes and big switching panels in the basement below sea level, uh, which was not a good idea because we have a lot of salt water dripping internally anyway. That was moved up a few years ago. It's up on the second floor. Um, Secondly, we built the new harbor walk and upgraded the infrastructure around the perimeter of the aquarium. Two years ago, we built that two feet higher than we otherwise might have, partly for operational reasons, but partly because of this. Um, we're an unusual building. We're more like a bunker, you know, one of the finest examples of, examples of architecture in the city. Um, so we're not like a residential or commercial structure where there are lots of windows, lots of doors, lots of garage entries, and so on. So we don't have that problem. But we do have vents and various things, and we have a system in place so that we can close those off um, if, if there is flooding coming. Uh, the biggest dilemma we face, quite frankly, is a moral dilemma, and that is if you took Sandy and put it in Boston, we would have to evacuate, and we would probably lose 30,000 animals. And, uh, but we have to put human beings first, plus just like everybody else. So that's, that's kind of our biggest challenge, is to figure out how to move animals around, how to have replacement power available. We have generators. Um, there's an interesting quirk in the city. We wanted to put them on the roof, but the fire department wouldn't let us because we're a very public building with a lot of people in it. So that's a piece we have to still figure out. Sure. Uh, one of the uh, solutions which you proposed in New York City, but not here, is uh, Seagate. And Boston is blessed with uh, a crowd of drumlins, uh, so that it's only a half mile between the end of uh, Long Island and uh, of deep water. deep water, and uh, Deer Island. Uh, so 
there have been proposals of a sluice gate there and also using the electricity from it uh, for the rest of uh, the Boston area. I had a couple of engineers in my building who did calculations on Pleasure Bay, which could be a prototype which uh, would produce about $100,000 worth of electricity a, a month. And the question is, why isn't that a good idea for the harbor, and why isn't that a good idea as a prototype? Okay. No, I, um, I think if we're going to think about adaptation, we have to think about every option. Options like that as well as decentralized approaches. And maybe it's a mix. Uh, but yeah, every coastal city is going to have to make that, make that analysis. Sort of the, the, you know, the, the major floodgate issue versus decentralized approach versus some mixture. But they both requires really careful analysis of all the possible impacts. Um, and so, just just to add a couple of things, you know, there are two two very different but related problems here. One is incremental rises in sea level over time, and the other is our storm surges, and then those combine together to create a really huge problem. But it's a very different challenge to to, to close off Boston Harbor against a storm storm surge, and you only close the gates when those surges are happening versus dealing with this problem of a one to three or four foot five sea level rise over time. And you can imagine, and what do we spend five, six billion dollars on cleaning up the harbor? It's a great recreational resource. Just imagine the ecological change if you put a dike across from Deer Island to Long Island that you would only open when shipping traffic came in, what would happen to the water quality and everything else in the harbor? So I think it's very different to design against, protect against sea level rise very incrementally a few inches a year over time or a few inches a decade versus something like New Bedford has or Providence has, which is close the gates when the big storm comes. Two, two very different problems. I'll take a couple more questions. Okay. Yes. Uh, can we assume that the as that was one of the first uh, efforts to preserve our waterfront to begin with? So, as many of you know, including the developers and the representative developers, we are probably the strongest supporter of Chapter 91 and including its implementation. Including the height restrictions? Sorry? Including the height restrictions attached to So, in some places, the height restrictions need to be modified through a municipal harbor planning process. And after analysis and study, depending on what the impacts on wind and shadow are, then there may be various offsets. We have been quite clear about that. We have been on the various municipal harbor plan committees. I would anticipate that the next one that's set up, the Boston Harbor Association will be on that. But we are uh, quite clear and we look at the data quite carefully. If you get our comment letters, if you have read the last four comment letters in the last five days, five work days, there is no doubt where this organization is on the on chapter 91. And for those of you who are not familiar with the link up, chapter 91 is the Thailand's uh, regulations, which set various standards for open space, setback, heights, and such. And there is a process through the state system, known as municipal harbor planning, which allows some variances from those standards, but they must be offset, whatever adverse impact. So we are probably the strongest proponent. And I think any developer, any developer's representative here would say there is not another organization that is as strong on Chapter 91. And they will not request an adjustment because they have to rise higher than their developments. They will be uh, held back from that. Oh, you're asking that if, in other words, if a building needs to be higher to make accommodations. That's they what you're asking? They are going to come to you and say... Well, I, mean, I mean, I think that's what David Belgelfer was alluding to at the 200, at the 210, 2010 conference on Boston Harbor Sea Level Rise. He represents NIOP and he raised the question that if some of these mechanicals need to be on a higher floor, would therefore there be any tolerance for increasing the height of a building to allow that? Is that what you're getting at? That plus additional floors, etc., should be not allowed because 91 is 91 and it has to be. So I, right now, and there are other people here from the state if they want to answer, but right now the state has not allowed additional height for this for taking into account the adaptation measures that have been talked about. But whether they will in the future is not clear. And uh, Mr. Belgelfer actually raised this issue first in 2010. Okay, thank you. I, yeah, this 
curious. We've, we've had some tr felt some tremors in the last few years. I'm wondering, have there been any significant studies done about the potential impact that a major earthquake could have in the Boston area? I don't think so. Thank you. I'm from East Boston from Member Landing, and my question to you is um, with this conversation, you know, gaining strength, climate change, extreme weather development, um, we are right there on the waterfront, um, Maverick Landing, and we, you know, are low income communities. I hear about these conversations because I basically, you know, seek this information, but really, most people of low income backgrounds don't have an option to relocate. It's not that they don't want to. They really can't, and they're really not well informed. So as this conversation takes place amongst people who are in, in the business, per se, um, how do you plan to actually bring this information to the local communities that don't really have an option you know, to you know, retreat or so forth? So Paul can also talk about it, but as you know, and as I indicated earlier, when we did the 2010 conference, we actually then had a series of community meetings that were held in the evening. That was actually that were actually held right at Maverick Landing and also at Harbor Point, both as you know, uh, with a fair number of subsidized housing and such. And we want to continue that dialogue. Uh, part of it is that, particularly at Maverick Landing, it's a combination of a, a CDC. Community Development Corporation development and also uh, some support from the Housing Authority. So one of the things that's clear as we move forward on that adaptation is to bring in a variety of other agencies. So as you've heard us talk about it today, we've worked very closely with the city, Brian and his staff in the Environment Department, and then we've also worked with the Boston Development Authority. But also it's clear that we also need to work, for example, with the Boston Housing Authority and Public Works Department and, and across a variety of cabinets uh, to address the issue that you're talking about. And Paul and his team have also done significant work with um, the East Boston Community through Melbourne. So, um, we're also working uh, with a project from the U.S. No, no, National Oceanic Administration um, on uh, climate change and environmental justice in East Boston. So we're working with the neighborhood organization for affordable housing there on this topic. So I'd like to get your information so I can keep up to date on that project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one more question and then we'll let you all mingle for a little while longer. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. I was really struck by the uh, Sandy and Boston plan you showed, in particular the impacts of Back Bay. And uh, was the implication that if uh, the dam was just a couple feet higher, lots, and it was tied in topographically in Cambridge and Boston, that those would not have happened? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, this raised the dam it would not solve the problem because we come around through MGH and also come around through some of the villainies Cambridge. But, um, and then I think also it might come around, you know, we want to work with LIDAR, so it's aerial photography, essentially. So we aren't exactly sure of the elevations. Yeah. And so uh, it's a little more complicated than just raising the dam. Because there'll be flooding coming from back, from back roots, I think. Um, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Bud. Um, uh, thanks. CBHA has its next challenge, uh, which is a big one, uh, but we're not afraid of that, are we? Uh, but thank you all very much for coming, and, uh, and we look forward to 2013. Thank you very much.